Good day, people of the plane. Hoping you're doing very well and looking after yourself. Nibi here with the fiber optically charged cables. You do know 95% of the plain earth is connected by fiber optic cables under sea, not by orbiting satellites in any such outer space. The 5% remainder is landline cables, thus 99% of all international data is transmitted by wires at the bottom of the oceans called submarine communication cables, not via orbiting satellite folks. This is our digital internet of today, the interweb that connects us all to each other under the sea. Fiber optic cables are very different from copper ones because fiber optic communications uses light to pass digital information from the sender to the receiver. An electrical signal is converted into pulses of light billions of times a second transmitted by a light emitting diode or a laser beam. <clears throat> now fiber optic cables form the backbone of today's telecommunications system around the plane, not these orbiting satellite signals. These have played this huge part on making the internet available around the earth. Fiber optic link around the plane is a 28,000 kilometer, so 17,400 miles or 15,120 nautical miles long fiber optic, mostly submarine communications cable that connects the United Kingdom to Japan, India, and many, many places in between. The cable is operated by Global Cloud Exchange and the system runs from the eastern coast of North America to Japan. Its Europe-Asia segment was the fourth longest cable in the world back in 2008. The Europe-Asia segment was laid by Cable and Wireless Marine back in the mid-1990s. Now, the SS Great Eastern was an iron sailing steamship that had the capacity to carry 4,000 passengers from England to Australia without ever refueling or ever flipping upside down, down under, just circumnavigating around the plain earth to her destinations before she was thus converted to the very first cable laying ship and was then laying the first lasting transatlantic telegraph cable in 1866. This is the map and isn't it amazing? And also part of the cable crushed by an iceberg. An iceberg. Now, we obviously use modern cable ships for laying the fiber optic cables around the plain earth, as you can see. Yet, in laying the Atlantic cable from the Great Eastern Steamer in 1866, the distance from Valencia on the southwestern coast of Ireland to Trinity Bay in Newfoundland, North America, was found to be 1,665 miles. The longitude of Valencia is 10 degrees 30 west, and of Trinity Bay, 53 degrees 30 west. The difference of longitude between the two places being 43 degrees, and the whole distance round the Earth being divided into 360 degrees hence if 43 degrees be found to be 1665 nautical or 1942 statuette miles 360 degrees will be 13,939 nautical or 16,262 statuette miles then taking the proportion of radius to circumference, we have 2,200 nautical or 2,556 statuette miles as the actual distance from Valencia in Ireland to the polar centre of the Earth's surface. What are the environmental effects, my friends, of laying a telecommunications cable onto the seafloor? You may be asking. 
how does it affect the ocean bottom and the animals that actually live there? Literally millions of kilometers of communication cables have been placed on the seafloor over the last century. Now, few very specific scientific papers have ever documented the effects of these cables on marine life. So a recent survey I found done in California actually said that cables had only minor impacts on animals living on and within the seafloor. However, we have only managed to study about 5% of the world's oceans, so this is mere speculative friends, isn't it? Only 0.5% of all the ocean explored is actually marine protected. There is a lot of water that the Earth rests upon. Don't forget, it's round about 72% water and 28% Earthland. So only 5% of the 72% total water has ever been studied. So that's 95% friends of all oceans totally unknown. And they say they know more about outer space than they do about here on plain earth. How stupid is that? Especially with illegal industrial and commercial fishing trawling destroying our seas and wildlife, leaving nothing but a barren wasteline behind in their destruction of the sea base. And not just for fishing either, this is for cables too. Remember, every year friends, 25 million acres are wiped out due to land deforestation. That's 27 football pitches every minute. However, Sea bottom trawling is wiping out 3.9 billion acres every single year. So this is the equivalent of 4,316 football pitches every minute being destroyed. Again, another reason to realize the earth land rests upon the water friends because you could wipe out Greenland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, UK, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, Turkey, Italy, Iran, Thailand and Australia combined every single year. Please try and think about that as this has been going on for many, many years already. According to the United Nations, we would only need 30 billion to actually combat the world hunger crisis, and NASA's annual financial budget is around 25 billion, soon to be increased. Would you care more for a human life starving thirsty child or for a starving computer generated image of an exoplanet with no water, air or life whatsoever? I just can't get my head around this. I wish I could open up a GoFundMe account, get the head of NASA's finances to back it in, and I will transfer it over to the head of the United Nations finances, and let's see what we can do in 12 months with 25 billion. Bringing me to Spaceballs. Now, Made in Space is apparently designing, wait for this friends, a self-assembling satellite as part of its orbital manufacturing business. Oh yes, it's also apparently built a machine to make fiber optic cable on board the ISS-2. But perhaps the most valuable product of Made in Space, at least any time soon friends, is the wire called Zeblan which is a niche form of fiber optic material that Made in Space plans to start selling in small quantities. Zeblan will be produced on the so-called International Space Station and then shipped back down to Earth for terrestrial use, of course, using some kind of Royal Space Mail. <laughs> Uh, fed SpaceX or something. Now, it does get better, friends, because the CEO, Andrew Rush, believes that once production ramps up, it will be a Netscape moment for space manufacturing. Re referring to the early web browser that propelled private investment in the internet. And my friends, listen to this clincher. NASA is keen to develop what it calls a low Earth orbit economy.
they know we only have inner space and not an outer space. So in 2018, NASA went to the stock exchange to try and sell the International Space Station. The Trump administration was trying to turn the ISS into a business. Now, isn't that typical? The Trump administration is not the first, though, to try and privatise low Earth orbit and the space station, because that honour goes to Ronald Reagan, the other celebrity turned president, as Reagan pushed for the creation of ISS. He backed for privatisation for its inception. And of course, friends, he knew the game and of course was a professional lover in outer space, UFOs and science fiction. You need to have that for the belief of the spinning globed earth. It's not made for world peace. Food for thought, friends. Back in March of 2019, Vice President Pence announced that it is the stated policy of this administration and of the United States of America to return astronauts, man and woman, to the moon within the next five years. So by 2024, the Trump administration requested a $22.6 billion for NASA's 2020 budget and case Dreria at the Planetary Society predicts that the agency will need an annual four to five billion increase at a minimum for the next several years in order to successfully hit that 2024 deadline. Now this is so much hard cash people. Remember what I said about solving the world hunger crisis. However, a faked moon landing in 2024 is much more important. Well, let's just see what happens in that date. What is the difference then between a fake satellite in an outer space and real fiber optics here in inner space? Well, reliability, of course. Fiber optic communication is far more reliable than any satellite signal could ever be. First, because it's real and outer space satellite communication is not possible, optic fiber has minimum or no delays, making it 100% suitable for real-time applications. Of course, if a cable breaks or it is damaged somehow here on plain earth under the sea, well, you can fix it with some difficulty. But if a so-called orbiting satellite breaks or fails in an outer space, well, who is going to fix that? IST? International Space Telecom? <laughs> Before it crashes thus back down to Earth? Think about how many thousands of them are supposed to be up there right now for all sorts of different things. Some travelling are over 7,000 miles, uh, 7, miles per hour, apparently. Think if about if you lose a mobile cell signal. Here, now, on plain Earth, there are many places that your phone will not work, and it's very scary to realize this, and you may realize far too late. Places like the hills of Hubbolt, California, to name but one, your phone will not work no matter how much you want it to be. They are trying to hide and blend in triangulation everywhere, but your phone will not work in many places now in 2021. But we will do an upload entirely on mobile cell technology in the coming year. But let's ask, why is not one satellite then ever damaged by space debris in an outer space? thus comes crashing back down at 7,000 miles an hour plus, or one of them failing in outer space for some technological reason, and then comes crashing down. One suddenly being hit by an incoming meteor or an asteroid. People seem to believe they hit the Earth in rock form, so how come do they miss every single one of them that's orbiting the Earth? That's kind of lucky, isn't it? Remember, thousands of them are supposed to be orbiting the Earth. What happens if a meteor or a small asteroid was to hit one and thus comes crashing back down to Earth? Think of that impact that it would cause over a populated area, especially if that satellite was from a from a nation. Some are supposed to be bigger than school buses, aren't they? However, the satellites that do crash down, well, what do you see? 
they're just high altitude solar balloons, aren't they? They do not look like the pitches they are they are supposed to look like. Satellites in an inner space and drones to help boost Wi-Fi signals from low Earth orbit. Please try not to buy into the Spaceballs theory, folks. It's not real. You are. And I am going to explain the real reason why I believe they hide this plain truth in the next upcoming upload. Something I have never heard anybody talk about, and I hope it can explain a few things that have actually come to fruition. So stay tuned for this one. And if you can, look in the mirror. If we don't protect it, we're going to lose this. The Earth is not a cartoon ball. The Earth land rests upon the very seas like the cables do at the bottom of it. And it's flat. Isaiah 40, 22. Be cool, friends. Ta-ta for now. And thank you for your time, as always. Just wait for the next one.